Those of you that are at home, you can take your seats as well. Amen, amen. <laughs> Apostle said, you've probably been running through the house rejoicing. Amen, amen. You know, this is such a uh, wonderful time. And um, I know, as you heard Apostle Rock say just now, there is a calling that is taking place. And, you know, over, there's been a lot of things that have gone on in 2020. Some people say a lot of crazy things that have gone on this year, you know. But I understand that it has been a time of preparation. And uh, God is preparing us for uh, what he wants to do next. And so there is a great move that God is doing and he's prepared, has been preparing us for. Um, today, I want to talk to you guys. It's something that the Lord has been um, building up on the inside of me, you know, for a little while. Um, and it ties into some of the things that I taught a little not too long ago on making your voice heard on high. But today we are going to talk about the power of effective prayer. And there's some, uh, some revelations that the Lord has given me on this to, um, to, that I'm going to share with you guys today. I'm going to try to share as many as I can today. It may spill over into next week as well. Um, I, I've learned to not do too much at one time, because then sometimes you're looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> so um, I want to build into it a little bit, and, you know, and I know th those of you that are here and uh, those of you that are out there, you may be very good Bible scholars and have studied uh, many different aspects as far as prayer is concerned, but we're going to get into some things today that are going to uh, appeal to all of us and are going to, um, you know, even further cement uh, the effectiveness of our prayer lives. So I'm going to ask you to turn over to the book of James, chapter 5. We're going to start there. Some of you already know where I'm going. <laughs> James, chapter 5. In the days that you and I live in, our prayer life is so, so crucially important. And, and I would say, you know, if you have not been a person of prayer, now is a very good time to start being a person of prayer. If you have been a person of prayer, then this is a very good time to continue being a person of prayer. And um, James chapter 5, verse 16, I'm going to read this first out of the King James Version. So follow along with me. And let's see where we go. You guys ready? You guys ready? I said, are you ready? Those of you that are out there watching us, are you ready? All right, okay, good. I'm ready. Verse 16, it says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. And then it says, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Um, and then it talks about Elijah. It says, he was a man of, subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. In the Amplified, in verse 16, it says it this way, Therefore, confess your sins to one another, your false steps, your offenses, and pray for one another that you may be healed and restored. And then it says, the heartfelt and persistent. Everybody say persistent. The heartfelt and persistent prayer of a righteous man. And then it has in parentheses, believer, not a doubter, not an unbeliever, okay, not a waverer, all right, but a believer. Everybody say believer. Say, that's me. But it says, a heartfelt, persistent prayer of a righteous man believer is able to accomplish much when put into action and made effective. Everybody say effective by God. It is dynamic and can have 
tremendous power. All right. So just in case you don't know, all right, and no, we're not on the Willie Mo, Mo Jr. show, all right? <laughs> just in case you don't know, there is power in your prayer. I'm going to say that again. Just in case you don't know, there is power in your prayer. And I'm going to say this to you guys that are out there viewing us. Just in case you don't know, and you haven't grasped that concept or you think, oh, little old me, how can my prayers be powerful? He says, the heartfelt, persistent prayers of the believing righteous man is powerful. It is effective. It bears tremendous power. The Bible says one shall put a thousand to flight, but it says two now we get into multiplication, exponentially powerful. It says, or more powerful, it says two shall chase 10,000. So one can chase a thousand. Hey, let's start there, okay? Let's start in your home where you are. Let's start on your job where you are. Let's start in your school where you are right now. One shall chase a thousand. What's being chased, okay? It ain't other believers. It ain't other people. All right, he's talking about things in the spirit world that's been trying to chase you. Now you turn around and say, hey, all right, now I'm the chaser, not the chasee. All right, as uh, I heard uh, uh, the late uh, Kenneth Hagin say one time, he said a friend of his was saying that, you know, he's been running uh, for the Lord, you know, uh, but he said the, the, the bad thing about it is that the devil has been the one that's been chasing him. You know, so you, we don't want the devil to be the one that's chasing us. We want to be the one that's chasing him away. Okay. Our prayers are effective and powerful. Okay. They, now some of us have prayed and we say, well, it didn't seem like God answered my prayers. Okay. And then sometimes because we don't think that our prayers are, are, are reaching to heaven. So we, we ask certain other people to pray for us. Okay. And there's nothing wrong. Okay, for anybody else or some other people to pray for us. Not everybody, okay? Okay, you guys understand the importance of that. You don't want uh, everybody praying for you, okay? In fact, you don't even want some people to know that something's going on with you, okay? So the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man who believes what God says, okay, is powerful. It bears tremendous power. And you got to understand that this is why God says, he that comes to me must believe, believe that I am and that I'm a rewarder of those who diligently seek me. Okay. And so Elijah prayed and guess what? He said, it ain't going to rain. He didn't just say that by his own power. He said that by the spirit of God, it ain't going to rain until I say it's going to rain. And then he said, all right, let's have the rain. He prayed to the Lord about the rain and God showed him. And then guess what? The rain came. All right. And so we understand this was one person. God gave us this example. All throughout the word, there are different examples. There are life examples. Just as Apostle Rock was up here, I learned a lot about prayer from watching him and listening to him pray when I was growing up. Okay. And, and he wasn't quiet. He wasn't mealy mouth about his prayers. Man, he, you know, I went to bed oftentimes with him praying in the spirit and praying before the Lord. And guess what? Man, there was such a peace in our home. And guess what? We didn't have everything that we wanted and that we needed. Every, you know, there were still issues and, and problems going on in life. Just as he said, Elijah was a man of like passions. He dealt with the everyday situations of life just as you and I do. But he knew how to pray. And this is what's going to cause us to be effective and powerful in the days that you and I live in. This is what's going to separate the men from the boys, okay, the winners from the losers, okay, the victors, okay, from the ones that's defeated, okay? And so we're going to look at some, all of the powerful aspects of our prayer life, okay, how effective our prayer life can be. All right, you guys ready? So in Luke chapter 11... The disciples come to Jesus, and, and, and it picks up in verse 1, and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. Now, it wasn't that they didn't pray themselves. 
all right? It wasn't that they hadn't learned certain things about prayer, but they saw an effectiveness. They saw a, a power that was coming from Jesus as a result of his prayers that was not present in their lives. So they say, Lord, he, he, we thought we knew how to pray, okay? All right? You know, that now I lay me down to sleep was good when I was three, you know? But now that I'm, uh, you know, a little bit older, I need something with a little bit more substance to it, you know? He said, they said, you know, teach us how to pray because we see, <laughs> we see when you pray, man, stuff happens, you know? Just as they say, you know, when, about Jesus, you know, you're not like the scribes and the Pharisees. You're like, you, when you say it, it's, you know, you're of authority, man. There, there's a difference. There's some weight behind your punches, you know? And so the disciples said, teach us how to pray because, man, we see something with you that's, that's not going on in our lives. So, you know, we, we need to know what's going on here. Teach us, all right? And so we're going to pick up and you know, of course, it's written in uh, Luke chapter 11. We're going to pick up in the uh, version that is in Matthew chapter 6. Okay. Matthew chapter 6. All right. And so we're going to start at verse 9. And Jesus said this in verse 9, and I'm probably only going to get through a couple of these verses because of what we're going to be talking about with this today, but that's okay. So Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, it says, after this manner. So this is Jesus still answering their question, okay? He said, after this manner. He didn't even say, um, say these words. He said, after this manner. So the, the, the religious world has, has taught us to that this is the Lord's prayer and to say these words, okay? This, he said, pray after this manner, okay? This is a pattern or this is a protocol of how we should pray, okay? This is a pattern or a blueprint of what prayer is supposed to look like. You understand? And so here are some things here that Jesus laid out. This is, if you would say, you would call it, this is the outline of how we are to pray. And you know, with an outline, you add parts to it, okay? And so this is the general outline of how we should pray. Not necessarily that these are the specific words that we pray, do you guys understand? Okay, and so he said, after this manner, okay, pray, our Father, which art in heaven. So he begins to introduce to them, as you heard me say back a few weeks ago when we were talking about making our voice heard on high, that, you know, understanding the fatherhood of God is a foundation for all of our prayer. So there was an aspect of prayer that they were not walking in where Jesus said, approach God, appeal to him as father. So before that, obviously, they were not appealing to God according to his fatherhood. And so Jesus teaching them, remember, he's answering the question that they asked. Lord, teach us how to pray. In other words, they were saying, teach us how to pray so that we get the results and the effectiveness that you're getting. So he says, pray after this way. Approach God as heavenly father. Okay? See, all throughout the Bible and all throughout the times, you know, now obviously they only had the Old Testament up to that point. And so there were different things that, that, that were revealed about God, but none of them was revealed of, as him being father. You understand? Jesus comes along and he reveals to them fatherhood and sonship. And he's saying, now approach me on the basis of fatherhood, okay? Think about fatherhood, okay? And so he even goes on in the next chapter and he talks about, you know, if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give to them that ask or give the Holy Spirit to, to them that ask, okay? And God wants us to be filled with his spirit. And this is why Jesus was saying this because he wants sonship, God wants to fill everybody out there. You might be a teenager. You might be out there. You might be an adult. I don't, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't matter. 
But God wants to fill everyone with his spirit. I'm not just talking about being born again. I'm talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. As the Bible says, those that are led by the spirit of God are the sons of God. Okay? So there is an impartation of, of sonship that comes through the spirit of God. The, the spirit of the father comes on his children. You understand? And so Jesus said, approach God on the basis of fatherhood. And he says, the father is good and he is benevolent. He is expressing to them so that when you go to God, don't, you know, you can expect that God is good and he wants to pour out his goodness on you. Just like a father, just like a little child coming up and, and, and sitting on the lap of their, of their dad. He could be the CEO of a major corporation in America. But guess what? That child, you know, you could be an employee at that corporation. But that child, being a child, has certain access, even though he may not be an employee there, but he has certain access because his dad or his mom is the CEO there. You understand what I'm saying? Okay? So we approach God on the basis of how good he is as father. And this is what Jesus was communicating. When you approach God, you can expect just like if you're, you being evil, as he said, know how to give good gifts to your children, your child. You know, he was just talking about people in general. In general he, he was just saying, if your child comes to you and asks you of something, you ain't gonna, you're going to attend to it. This is the benevolence of, of a father that he is expressing and how God is. So firstly, when you approach God, expect that he's going to pour out his goodness on you as father. Do you understand? And this is, this is where it increases our faith so that when we approach him, we, it's not like maybe he'll, you know, he'll do it or maybe he won't. Is I know that he is my heavenly father, that he loves me, and he wants to give and pour out his blessing on me. For God so loved the world that he did what? Gave. He gave his only begotten son according to what was needed. That's what he gave. Okay? And so... He said, understand the benevolence, the fatherhood, and approach God that way. As it says in, in, in other scriptures in the New Testament, Abba, Father, or Daddy God. He is the one that is the source. You understand? He is the one that is the source. See, there should not be any confusion as to who is our source or what is our source. See, God blesses us through people but it comes from him. Do you understand? See, sometimes people have gotten confused in thinking that the blessing has come from a person or it's come from my job or it's come from my business or from this or that. It has come through those things, but it comes from God. And this is what you must understand. And this is why it's so easy when we receive a blessing, when we receive increase, now I can bring it back and present it to, to before God because he is my source. He is a giver of everything that I have and that I would ever need. You understand? And so when we approach God as Father, we are understanding, we are appealing to him on the basis of Abba Father. He is the source. He is the sustainer. He is the preserver. He is the one that keeps me. I'm approaching him on the basis of his benevolence. You guys understand? So Jesus said, approach God as father, not just as, you know, the big title, but as father, firstly. Then he says, he says, our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So in other words, <laughs> firstly, we approach him as, as daddy, as dad, as our father, but now he says, don't also get it flipped that he's still not supreme ruler of the universe. <laughs> you understand? So he says, you have been given the privilege to approach God as father. You have access as a son now. Okay, that's special privilege right there. He's saying you have special privilege as a son to be able to approach him. But he says, also make sure at, even as the Bible says a son honors his father, that you honor and you reverence the name of the father, okay? That we don't become so casual 
that we forget his holiness. You understand? That we don't become so uh, loose-minded that, about it that we, we forget that he is still king on the throne. All right? See, there's an account in, uh, in Esther chapter 1 where it talks about uh, Vashti. She was the, the queen of uh, uh, Ahasuerus, and um, the king gave this commandment for her to come before all the nobles. He was having his feast, and he gave the commandment for her to come because she was beautiful and so on, and to wear the crown and so on, so he could show her off before the rest of his, you know, all of his invited, honored guests. And she refused, okay? She refused on the basis of her, him being husband and not un understanding that he was also king. You understand? That when the king gives a decree, that it should be honored and obeyed. See, this is a difference, and this is sometimes how in our modern day, our democracy-mindedness, it, it prevents us from having the kingdom-mindedness that we should have. And when I say that, what I mean is that because in our country, at least in the United States, um, we are in a democracy where we're used to voting and expressing our rights and our opinions on what we deem is what we want and so on. You know, sometimes whether it's right and sometimes whether it's not right. Okay? But that is a part of democracy. But in the kingdom, it is whatever the king says goes. Okay? And so when God tells us or instructs us in something, sometimes our, our opinionated democracy-mindedness gets in the way of what God the king is saying that we should do. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so this is what was going on in this particular case. And she's like, I'm not coming. And then as a result of that, she got kicked out of her position as queen and Esther was put in her place. You understand? And so, um, so we should honor and reverence the name of God. He says, you know, you, we come before him as father. We approach him. That's the basis of our prayers. That's the confidence that we can have when we approach God that he is my father and he wants to do good unto me. If there isn't good that is going on, it's not because there's a disconnect on God's end. It's because something that, you know, I need to get straight on my end. Do you understand? But God is benevolent and he is good, even as the Bible says to all. Those that acknowledge him and those that don't, he's still good to all. Okay? And so we have the opportunity to approach him as father. And we can receive, but we also understand and regard and are aware of his holiness of, of how awesome and, and that he is king. You understand? And this is what Jesus is saying here. This is why Jesus said in the garden, he says, not my will, but yours be done. Okay? So not uh, based on how I feel right now and, and, and all the pain that I know that this is going to cause me, but he says, not my will, but your will be done. See? And, and this, is, this is what we're going to get into in the next one. It says, thy kingdom come, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So he says, this is what we should be praying according to the, the kingdom of God that is in heaven, how it is in heaven. This is what Jesus preached was the kingdom of God. Even he said, uh, when the gospel of the kingdom is preached all over the world, then the end shall come. There is a gospel of the kingdom that is not always taught in the church. But there's a gospel of the kingdom. Jesus said, thy kingdom come. The authority, the power, the dominion of the kingdom. He says, thy kingdom come. How does the kingdom come? By the will of God being done. Okay? See, if the will of God is not being done, the kingdom of God is not going to follow. It's not going to come. Do you understand? Okay? And when God seeks to advance his kingdom in the earth, okay, he does it in earth, okay? The first earth that God does or expresses his kingdom in is you and I. As the Bible says that, that God formed man's body from the dust of the ground, of the earth. The first kingdom set or station or area that God sets up is in earth, in us. You guys understand? Okay, for it to be in the earth. All right? So 
Let's turn over to, let's turn over to, let's see, Ezekiel chapter 22. See, notice it said in Matthew 10, 6, 10, he says, that will be done in earth. It's done in earth so that it will be done on the earth. Ezekiel chapter 22. And we're going to start at verse 29. You guys there? All right. I want you to understand how powerful your prayers are and how important your prayers are. So I have several things that the Lord has given me, you know, and as I said, I don't think that we will get through all of them today. Um, you can write this down before we get into this scripture. Effective prayer appeals to God as father, as friend, and as judge. And we've talked about that uh, previously. But effective prayer appeals to God as father, as friend, and as judge. Okay? And it's important that you understand and be able to differentiate when one is needed more than the other. Okay? And so, but we appeal to God as father, as friend, and as judge. And that's all throughout scripture, okay? One of the things that was missing from the disciples was appealing to God as father. And, and you know, and even throughout that, um, it, was, it was not just in Matthew chapter six, but even through the discourse of the next few chapters, Jesus was still talking about prayer to them, okay? And, um, and the things of the kingdom. Um, you can write this down. Prayer must precede, proceed, and succeed our lives, our plans, our purposes, our pursuits, and our callings. Prayer must precede, okay? So before you, you, you go out and you do whatever it is that you think that God is directing you to do, prayer must be before it, okay? All right? If you want to have success, you better pray before you go out and and you know, for various reasons, okay? It must precede, it must proceed. That means once it started, it must continue, okay? And sometimes when we see that, that things start to drop off, it, sometimes it can be traced back to a lack of prayer that is going on, okay? And then it must succeed. Even at the end and after the end, there still must be prayer that goes on, even as God transitions to the next thing. And so... Um, this, this must be in our lives, our plans, our purposes, our pursuits, and our callings, okay? And, and, and through prayer, God brings even more clarity in these things. Through prayer, God opens up doors that are needed to be opened. Through prayer, God shuts doors that need to be closed. As Apostle Rock has been teaching on that on Wednesday, how God communicates through us, through open doors, and, you know? So uh, our prayers are a factor in that as well. Um, when it comes to prayer, we should think over three main areas. Think personal, and I don't think I have to tell anybody about personal, you know. As it was, you've heard it said before, uh, the person praying for me, my four, no more, you know. So we don't, we don't have to be told to pray for our own needs, really, do we? <laughs> but prayer covers that, and God wants to answer the prayers about your personal needs, you know. He, he's, he's very concerned about your personal needs. In fact, the Bible says, uh, you know, in, in verse 8 of what we uh, didn't read in, in Matthew chapter 6, he says, your heavenly father knows what you need before you even ask. Okay? All right, so, but prayer begins to connect us. And so, um, God wants your personal needs met. We must also think corporately. Okay? Uh, our prayer should be a part of not just as us as individuals, but corporately as a body of Christ or as a ministry here, even about specific things that God has instructed us here, okay, about specific things pertaining to the vision here, about specific things pertaining to the body of Christ corporately as a whole, and then globally, okay, what God is doing all around the world. This is why Jesus said, thy will be done in earth, okay, all over the earth, as it is in heaven. So God starts us here where we are. He starts with you 
the individual earth, okay? He starts with you, and then he begins to expand his territory here on the earth, all right? And it says here, in verse 29, it says, the people of the land have used oppression and exercised robbery and have vexed the poor and needy. Yea, they have oppressed the stranger wrongfully. And look at what the Lord says here. So you got to understand the importance of, of your authority here in the earth. God doesn't do things without, through men. You must understand, you know, Apostle Rock said this, uh, I don't know if it was last Wednesday or Wednesday before last, but it was very profound. He said, God's sovereignty does not negate, okay, your responsibility. Okay, so we, we have to understand our responsibility as active participants in God's plan here in the earth. This is why I said that thy will be done in earth. The first earth that God does anything in is you. When God wanted to start this ministry, he didn't just send an angel down here to build this building. You know, he said, Apostle Rock asked the question, why can't there be a place where your people can worship you in spirit and in truth and grow up and learn about you? And God says, aha, I got you now. <laughs> now I have something to work with in Fredericksburg. He said, there can be. You understand? So God partners with us, or should I say we partner with God Okay, yeah, let's say that the latter. We partner with God in the earth according to his will and his counsel from heaven. This is why the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, that I will, I wish that you had the same mind, the same uh, purpose or judgment. I'm paraphrasing in my own words, but you can read it, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, okay? And what God wants us, you know, Unity is a very powerful thing, and we've seen it in many different organizations all around the world. It doesn't have to be righteous cause that people go after, but if people get united, just as in the Tower of Babel, it was not a righteous cause, but they were united. But when you get a group of people that join in according to God's counsel on something, this is why the prophetic word is so important. This is why when you can get God to say something to you and everybody joins in in one judgment on that thing, that this is what the Lord says, this is what it is. Now you have the authorization to go before the Lord and bring it before him, this is what you said. You have legal authorization now to bring it back before the Lord. This is what his word is. It's legal authorization to put him in remembrance of what he has said. So whether you're doing it individually or whether we're doing it corporately as a church or as a body of Christ as a whole, and this is why the enemy tries to keep us so divided, keep us with our, this is my opinion on it, and this is my opinion on it, well, I think it should be this. But if we can get one judgment, what does the counsel of the Lord say? What is God saying to us at this moment? Now, okay, we can effectively pray, okay? See, prayer is not, now Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, it talks about how prayer is making our requests known to God, and it is. Prayer is not just us making our request known to God. It is expressing the will and the counsel of God before heaven and the earth. We see examples in the word where there were, in the account of the children of Israel, when they were about to go into the promised land, Numbers chapter 13. The latter part of that chapter talks about how they brought back an evil report because they said, there are giants in the land and we're not able to overcome them. We are as grasshoppers in our eyes and we are in their eyes, okay? God had already given the word 400 plus years prior that they are going to possess a land that is not theirs. That was God's legal 
authority and authorization to walk in and to possess the land. They knew that. But there were things within themselves. That wasn't God. Okay. There were things within themselves. There were things that they had inherited in the world or in Egypt that they brought and they said, well, you know, Moses, you have a great vision and a great plan. You know, it includes dental and 401k. You know, it includes a lot of good benefits. But we are not able to participate in this. This is what they were saying. We're not able to participate in God's plan. The Bible says that this was an evil report. That's what God said about it. It was an evil report because they did not reciprocate what God had already said. They said something else before the courts of God and before the people. And God said, this is an evil report. So he says here in verse 30, there was all of this stuff that was going on in the land. And he says, I sought for a man among them, okay, that shall make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it. And then he says, but I found none. So don't think that your prayer, he didn't say I sought after men. He says, I sought after a man, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. You know, the Lord has shared something with me back in 2016 that I thought was for then, and then lo and behold, it was uh, a few months ago that the Lord said, no, this is for now. And one of the things that was a, a part of, of what he had shared was he said that, he, he told me this it, directly. He said, your prayers uh, um, cause heaven to be open over this ministry, okay? He wasn't talking about me at the time. I thought he was talking about me because I was praying at the time. But what he showed me this year, and this is why, you know, you have to get, you have to pray even when God shows you something so you can get, you know, more discernment and understanding about it. But he showed me certain things that were applied to now, certain things applied to me in my life. But then he said he was referring to Apostle Rock. He said, his prayers are what keeping this place open and then, you know, heaven open over this place. And then as I began, and it clicked with me because I had right before that really started studying the courts of heaven and the altars and the importance of altars and understanding that what God started here, God sought a man when he wanted to do something in Fredericksburg. Do you understand? And this man praise okay this man prays and he has established through his prayers and through him laying out his life before the Lord and he has built an altar before the Lord in Fredericksburg that now God has a place that is connected to heaven where he can pour out his blessings and everything that he wants to do here in this area so now we become an expression of what God wants to do in this area. And to the degree that we all join in and hook into the vision, okay, it, in, that expression of God becomes increased and multiplies and becomes many folded in this region. Do you understand? And so when God wants to do something, it says that, he seeks a man who will stand in the gap to fill the hedge so that, because God doesn't want to wipe it out. He doesn't want the curse there. He wants to bless because he is a good, benevolent father. And he wants to pour out. And so he says here, I sought a man who would stand, who would make up the hedge because <laughs> there's some gaps there. There's some things there, but I want to overlook it. I want to bless, but I need someone who's willing to lay down their life so that I can do what I really want to do, and that is bless people. And so it says, in this particular case, he found none, but uh, 
And then God, in turn, had to pour out his wrath and indication. So think about, this is why God raised you up in your family. He looked in your generations and he said, I, I, I see the stuff that's there, but I, I'm looking for someone in their generation that is willing to step out, that is willing, who's, who's, who wants to answer the call, that's willing to partner with me in their generation so that their generational line after them, so that their family, so that their area, their workplace, so that they would be blessed. But I'm looking for a person that will, that will come out from among their family, that will come out from among wherever you have been and is willing to say, Lord, here I am, send me. You understand? So this is what God is looking for. And you know what? I'm going to stop right here for today. <laughs> There's so much more that I want to share today, but he told me to stop here. So, now, Apostle Rock has stood in the hedge. But that's not just for him. God started it with him so that there would be so many more. Do you understand? This is where you and I come in, okay? Because there are some other gaps that God wants to fill. There, there, you know, the more we spend time in prayer, the more effective our spiritual life becomes. No matter whether you're ushering, greeting, coaching, teaching, uh, working in, you know, in the factory, no matter what it is that you do, you may have a desk job, whatever it is that you do, the, the more your prayer life is intact and you build that altar, that's where we live from, is that place. And it becomes more of an expression of who God is, and this is what God wants to do here. You heard Apostle Rock say several things lately. One about what God would do after he turned a certain age in this ministry. So when we hear something like that, okay, it's legal authorization for us now to say, Lord, this is what you said. You understand? Let's, 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 <laughs> let's look at this so you can see this. Let's turn to um, Isaiah chapter 62. Isaiah chapter 62. See, this is the difference between the first time when Apostle Rock spoke certain things, there were not enough people speaking it before God, but there were people that were offering up an evil report. And he says, Isaiah chapter 62 Isaiah 62, let's see where we go, verse 6. He says, I have set watchmen upon the walls, O Jerusalem. As God says, we are to watch and pray. Which shall never hold their peace day nor night. You that make mention of the Lord, keep not silence. And give him no rest till he establish, till he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. So whenever God issues out a word, this is what this is going to be. Well, this is what my counsel says. This is what I will as the king. Whenever God issues out, see, this is why the prophetic word is so important. What is a prophetic word? It is a word that comes from the prophet. It's a word that comes, a now word that God has for us that gives us direction, that gives us counsel, that gives us an, an, a peek into what he wants to do. Jesus is walking back and forth between the candlesticks and he's speaking to the apostles and said, this is what I want you to do right now in the, in the church. This is what I want. He's speaking to those that are, in, uh, that are in these positions all around the world. And he says, there must be watchmen that are before the Lord day and night, that once you find out what the counsel of God is, 
that you don't let up. You say, Lord, this is what you said. This is what you said. I'm going to speak this before you. I'm reminding you of what you said. This is what you said. Doesn't matter what it looks like. Doesn't matter what the resources are. Doesn't matter who knows what it doesn't know what. This is what you said, Lord. This is what you said. This is what's going to be. Day and night, this is the prayer that we offer up and we bring before the court of God as a righteous judge. Now, Lord, you said this. I have legal grounds because you authorize this. This is not something that I want and I'm just making up. You have authorized this from heaven. So I partner with you here in the earth and I decree and I declare that your will be done here in the earth as it has been decreed in heaven. You understand? This is how we're going to walk in the new Faith Christian Center, World Outreach. You understand? So when he declares by the Spirit of God, it's, yes, Lord, this is what you are saying. This is what your prophet has spoken. As, as the old movie says, so let it be written, so let it be done. Okay? You understand? Let's stand on our feet. So, you guys heard some things have been said recently about the favor of God and what God wants to do. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have uh, uh, Pastor John, because um, I know you have the footage of it, and you guys can go back on uh, the live streams um, on the site and, and check it out. But all of the specific things that Apostle Rock has said, that the Lord has said, we should take it to heart and bring it back before the Lord, because when God has spoken that, that is a now word for us to say, Lord, you have authorized this. <laughs> You've authorized this, you know? So now this is, this is who we are. This is what we have. And so you walk in that. You understand? You don't doubt it. You don't waver in it. You have the same judgment, okay? According to God's judgment, that's what he's saying there. God has judged this. He has issued a decree that this is what I desire. This is what I purpose, okay? That's my judgment on the matter. So now let us have the same judgment and thy will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Amen? <laughs> all right. All righty, all righty, all righty, all righty, all righty. Well, God bless you. Those of you that are out there, you've been watching us and, you know, I pray that you have understood and you've been a recipient of, of the goodness of God today. God is a good God. He is a benevolent father who, who wants to bless and pour out his blessings on your life. I, I can personally attest to the goodness of God. He is so good and so wonderful, so kind, so forgiving, so forgiving. And so I want to extend an invitation to those of you that are out there watching us. And if there's anybody even in the house here today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and as your Lord, I want to lead you in a prayer that on today, this 13th day of December, you can close out this year on the best high note that you could possibly close out on. And that's inviting the Lord Jesus into your life to be your Lord and to be your Savior. Through this means you can punch or stamp your ticket into heaven and the best life here on the earth that there is. The Bible says that God loves you so much that he gave. He's such a benevolent father that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. That whosoever, one day I was a whosoever. I believed on him and I accepted him and he came into my life. And I want the same for you. You know, I saw someone that I know and that used to go to church with 
And I saw him doing some things that weren't godly. You know, and, and the, the question came up to me. Because this person got away from the things of God. And the question came up, and I'm asking you this as well. Where could you be if you had not believed the lie? See, where could you be in your life right now if you had not believed the lie that was told you? There is no heaven or there is no hell. God doesn't love you. You're nothing. Where could you be in your life right now if you had, be had not believed the lie? So I'm telling you the truth today, that God loves you that he gave himself for you. Won't you pray with me today? I want you to say these words after me, and this is going to be the prayer from your heart. So, dear Heavenly Father, I come before you today in the name of Jesus. You said in your word that if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that you raised him from the dead, that I would be saved. So I confess Jesus as Lord of my life to be my master. I believe that you died for me and that you were raised after three days. I invite you in right now. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for loving me and for saving me now. In Jesus' name. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer, God bless you. We celebrate with you. We rejoice with you right now. As you have just passed from darkness into light, the blinders are coming off right now. All the scales that have been preventing you from seeing what life has really been about are now opening up to you. I want you to let us know if you prayed that prayer because we want to continue to support you. We want to continue to minister to you because we know that this is just the beginning of the journey. There's so much more that God wants to do for you and through you in your life. So if you're in the Fredericksburg area, we invite you to become a part of this house. We have services on Sundays at 10, Wednesday nights at 730. And we invite you to become a part of our live in-house service. We do honor all of the social distancing and, and we wear a mask and all of those things. But in addition to all of those things, we believe God and we trust God. And we enjoy the a company of, of fellowship of other believers here. And so we invite you to become a part of what God is doing here. This great work that God has established in this region and in this generation. Even if you are watching us on live stream and, you know, just if you have any questions about this ministry, drop us a line, send us an email, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. But we want you to know that God doesn't want you just sitting at home. He doesn't want you just looking and viewing from afar. He wants you to be an active participant to make up the hedge. Amen? Amen. If you have any prayer requests or if there's anything that's going on with you, I'm going to ask you to stretch your hands towards your screen right now or anyone else up here. And we're going to speak the word of God's blessing and healing over your life right now. Father, it's in the name of Jesus. We bless you and we thank you. For you have provided everything for us that we need. And so even as those that are out there viewing us on live stream, as some have extended their hands because there are things 
circumstances, situations, problems in their lives that they need resolution to right now. And so, Father, you know exactly as your word says, you already know the problem before we even pray. So right now, according to your goodness, and even as there's someone out there that, 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 that hasn't understood your goodness and they don't know of how good you are, right now, Father, by according to your goodness, I ask you to release unto them the answer to the problem or the situation that is going on in their lives. Release from your hands the healing that they need in their bodies or the peace from their, for their minds that they need. That financial breakthrough that they, they need in their life right now. Whatever the case is, Father, you know what is going on. And I thank you for answering the problem right now in Jesus' name. And so we glorify you, Father, and we honor you. And we, we give you all the glory and the praise right now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, if you have given tithes or offerings out there, um, the, the, for those of you that are viewing us out there and those of you that are in-house, we also want to pray with you right now as we believe in honoring uh, the, the one who is our source. The Bible says that we bring all our tithes and our offerings before the Lord. And as we do that, God honors us. There is blessing that is pronounced over us. There are things that God issues from our obedience to doing that. And it keeps, it, it sanctifies the rest of our finances and it keeps the curse out of our lives. The thing that would try to rob, steal, and kill from us. Aren't you tired of that? And so I want to lead you in a prayer right now. So I'm going to ask you to join. And let's, as the Bible says, we bring before the Lord our tithes. Let's worship him right now with our tithes and with our offerings. Father, we come before you right now. And we bless you for the increase that you have brought into our lives this week. We honor you, Father, today as a son honors his father. We honor you today, Father, and, and, and thank you for how good you have been to us. You have provided for us throughout this year, even this week, even this day, Father. For you give us daily our daily bread. And so we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name for blessing us, for increasing us, not just financially, Father, but with good health, with peace of mind. You, you bless our families. You, you give us the increase in all the areas where we need increase, whatever it is. And so we thank you for it. Thank you for our jobs. Thank you for our businesses and all other sources of revenue that you bless us through, Father. We look to you as a source. And we turn to you, Jesus, as our faithful high priest. Hallelujah. And we ask you to turn and worship the Father even on our behalf with all of the tithes and offerings that are presented here on this day, even for those that are out there viewing us through live stream. Thank you, Father, for your blessings, your favor, for the increase that you continuously bring in our lives, Father. We thank you, Father, for the wealth transfer. Thank you for the open doors of favor right now. And we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise for it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Will somebody give God a shout of praise right now? Amen. 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 All righty. Well, um, on the behalf of Apostles Chastine and Ella Rock, um, I am Pastor Milton. This is Faith Christian. What a, who are you? All right, Faith Christian Center World Outreach. We say God bless you. May he keep you this week. May his face continue to shine towards you. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Amen.